Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the Calist Visualization Core Laboratory, and I'm also a certified instructor with software and data carpentry. This afternoon, we're going to continue our uh, Introduction to Data Science workshop series, and we'll be covering an introduction to SQL programming. So without any further ado, I want to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. So on the left-hand side, we have the excellent teaching notes from, uh, from Software Carpentry. Um, Software Carpentry, if you're not familiar with Software Carpentry and Data Carpentry, so they are uh, global nonprofits, um, communities who are focused on teaching foundational uh, scientific computing, data science and machine learning skills to mostly um, students and faculty and staff in academia, but also um, in industry and um, in various governments uh, around the world. They hold workshops all over the world, including, and there's been a few even in Antarctica. Um, and I've been privileged to teach uh, a fair number of these workshops in the UK and obviously here in Saudi Arabia and Japan um, and a few other places. So their teaching notes are, are really top notch and we're going to be relying on them again today. Now for compute, we're going to be using uh, compute resources provided by, um, if you're here at CALST, my colleagues at the CALST Research Computing um, Division or group. So they are um, responsible for, for maintaining the uh, CALST Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub uh, installations that allow um, students and staff and researchers to leverage the, the power of Jupyter Hub uh, and Jupyter uh, notebooks and uh, Binder Hub for teaching and research uh, for all their interactive computing needs. If you're joining us from outside of CALS, then you'll be able to take advantage of the same computing resources, um, but provided by the Public Binder Hub Foundation, um, which is a great uh, nonprofit group that is providing um, interactive, free interactive computing resources um, for the world. Okay, so um, without further ado, so let's actually get started. So um, uh, just a couple of, of user interface things. So this afternoon, we're gonna be using uh, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab. So if you have uh, participated in the introduction to Python a couple of weeks ago, then you'll be very familiar with Jupyter, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so the things that you just need to know for today, if, if you uh, missed out on those courses, is that um, we have a little directory in here called Introduction to SQL. So if you double click on that, you'll be kind of taken into the Introduction to SQL uh, directory. So this is kind of our working area for the course today. We're primarily going to be working in this notebooks directory. And here I've actually already added a few um, notebooks to help us, us get started. Um, and then in the data directory, whoops. Um, in the, sorry, introduction to shell data directory, we have this database file. And this is the, contains the database that we're going to be, um, that we're going to be working with for the course of, uh, of the workshop this afternoon. It's the same database file that is referenced in your teaching notes here and that you can download locally by just clicking on this, uh, on this link here. Right. So this database um, contains some, some data from the, uh, the early 1900s on an, a, a research expedition to the South Pole um, by uh, four researchers. The data was kind of collected, um, scanned, you know, all the handwritten notebooks and stuff where this data existed was then scanned um, and OCR and then uploaded into something to uh, uh, as a storage unit. So you could have put it in a CSV file, you could have put it in a text file, um, but in this case, decided to put it into a SQLite database um, so that we can uh, use it as a teaching resource for learning how to write SQL queries. Okay. So that's kind of the background of, of where this, this data is from. So there is, um, in the teaching materials, there is a setup section and we don't need to do any of this today, but I'm just drawing your attention to it um, because if you are, uh, if you want to uh, run this locally, um, there are some 
kind of instructions and hints here about how you might want to help get set get started um, uh, installing SQLite and and whatnot uh, manually. But as I said, we don't need to do any of that today. So we'll get started with uh, selecting data. Okay. So over here, I'm just going to um, navigate back to my introduction to SQL uh, notebooks. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and open um, two notebooks. So one notebook is sandbox.ipynb. So if you double click on this and open it, um, you will see uh, a kind of pre-populated notebook here with some stuff to help us get started. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the next notebook is called this Zeus Sandbox IPyNB. So if you double click on that, then you'll open another notebook that again has one line at the top and then is otherwise empty. Okay. So after you've opened these two files, then we can hide this um, this uh, file browser by just um, clicking on it to hide it. So I'm going to get a bit more room. Um, and actually, I think what I might do is squish these teaching notes just a little bit and give myself a bit more room with my uh, Jupyter Lab server. OK. And now what I'm going to do is so we can see both of these notebooks at the same time. I'm going to drag the Zeus sandbox down to the bottom. And so we'll have kind of split pane uh, notebooks. And um, we'll work like this for a little bit. So um, you might be wondering why, uh, why are we using two notebooks? Uh, and the reason is that um, rather than uh, teach you SQL from, by writing SQL commands in kind of a standalone um, SQL database uh, database manager. I decided to teach you SQL by writing SQL queries the way that I write them, which is within Jupyter Notebooks. And that's usually because for me, extracting SQL, writing SQL queries is an intermediate step to extract data from a database and pull it into a pandas data frame where I'm then going to analyze it as part of some machine learning pipeline. And so for me, it's much more efficient to just start in a Jupyter notebook because that's where I want to be anyway. And so I'm going to teach you how to write SQL queries entirely from within the Jupyter notebook. Now, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. So one way is that you can use a, um, a software package called IPython SQL, which is already installed in this uh, Conda environment. In fact, if you were to uh, navigate out to the environment file, you will see that IPython SQL is listed here as a dependency in this Conda environment. So it's already been installed. And that handy um, um, IPython SQL package allows you to load this special extension that will allow you to um, write SQL commands inside of Jupyter Notebooks or inside of an IPython console. And you load it by executing this first cell where it says percent load extension, which is a, a what's called an IPython magic command for loading um, this extension called SQL. So if we hit shift and enter to execute that command, that will load the extension. And then that will allow us to write SQL commands by uh, either a single line prefixing um, a percent and then a percent SQL. And then anything after this will be, um, roughly speaking, interpreted as a SQL, uh, a SQL uh, statement. So then if we hit Shift and Enter, we will then connect to the database. OK? And then from here on, we can start writing queries. Now, this is writing basically, this is going to the, at the top notebook here will be examples of writing queries within the um, within a Python based, because you can see it says a Python 3 based notebook. So anytime we want to write something that's not Python, we then need to 
do something like have a magic command and then prepend it with this uh, percent SQL, for example, to write some SQL command and have it interpret it as a SQL command. An alternative is to launch um, a Zeus uh, SQL, um, a Zeus SQL notebook. And in your launcher, you may have noticed that there is this extra um, uh, launcher for both notebooks and consoles. And if you were to click on this, it would launch a notebook that would be running a different kernel, this X SQL, which stands for Zeus SQL kernel. And what that simply means is that this notebook is a SQL notebook. So you can write SQL commands directly into the notebook and those commands will be executed as SQL, not as Python. So for example, if we, on this notebook at the bottom, if we do shift and enter, we'll load the database. And now um, we can start writing SQL commands. And so what I'm going to do, so this is the first time that I've actually included uh, the Zeus uh, SQL kernel as part of this training. So what I'm gonna do at least for a while is I'm gonna show, I'm gonna write commands um, at the top using the IPython SQL uh, um, extension. And then at the bottom, just in pure SQL, so that you can see the two different styles. And then at some point, I may go ahead and just stop and continue with um, one of the notebooks if it's, taking, uh, if it's taking too long. But then you're free to continue with either of the, the two flavors, depending on how you, um, depending on which you find more, uh, more appealing. Um, so let me just check the chat real quick. Um, okay. Okay. Right. Um, so, all right. So now with that kind of little intro, let's, we can actually dive into the teaching notes. Okay. So with this, in this lesson, we're going to talk about selecting data. So we want to talk about how to get data out of a database. So we're going to talk about some basic things like what is a table, a record, and a field, the difference between a database and a database manager. And then we're going to write some queries to select specific fields from a table and database. Okay. So, uh, a relational database is just a way to store um, uh, and manipulate information. So um, a CSV file is one way to store data. A text file is uh, another way to store data. Um, and um, so a relational database is just going to be another way to store, to store data. Um, most of the world's data is locked up in relational databases. And the language of relational databases is SQL. So SQL is perhaps unsurprisingly the most widely used programming language in data science. Um, not as much in academia, but definitely in industry. And that's because if you want to um, if you want to work with data, analyze data, build machine learning models with data, then you need to be able to extract the data from where it lives, which is typically in a relational database somewhere. So in these databases, data is arranged in tables. And tables have columns, which are sometimes called fields, and rows, which are often called records. And that is how the data is stored. So most of us are, are reasonably experienced with thinking about tabular data, so data that comes in tables. We might be more experienced using CSV files or tab delimited files or something like this. Um, but the, same, the, the structure is, is similar. Um, so when you are, for example, like when you're using a spreadsheet, um, you can put formulas into cells and then calculate new values based on the values in other cells. Um, when we're using a database, we send commands, which are going to be called queries to a database manager. And this database, man this database, database manager then takes that query and uses it to go off and select the data that we want and then returns it to us. 
So it's the database manager that does the lookups and computation and stuff that is specified in the query. So like the query language, SQL in this case, is the way that we talk to the database manager in a structured way so that the database manager that can then say, okay, right, I know how to get this data out of the database for you and runs off and gets it and returns it and says, here it is. Um, there are many, many, many database managers for SQL databases. Um, there is, you know, Oracle, IBM, Postgres, MySQL, uh, Microsoft Access, and SQLite. So each of these database managers um, maybe speaks a slightly different dialect of SQL, uh, maybe has some special features or is tuned for particular kinds of data, like maybe time series data or, um, or other kinds of, of data, and stores the data in a slightly different way internally. And so um, the database manager can then, um, for each of these different kinds of SQL databases, will operate slightly differently in terms of how it extracts data from the database and returns it to you. But the language that we speak to the database managers in is generally the same, minus a few kind of different features here and there that differentiate these different database products. Okay, so uh, getting into and out of SQLite. So you can also access uh, SQLite from a terminal, from a bash terminal. And that's what this uh, little uh, call out box is, is walking you through the process of accessing the uh, SQLite directly from the SQLite database directly from the uh, command line, like a bash terminal. We're not going to do that uh, today. I'm going to show you how to work entirely within Jupyter Notebooks because I, I find that this is much more um, efficient and, and maps more closely to the kind of work that I do um, on a day in day out basis and how I think that you will come to use SQL if you start to adopt it um, or if you want to link it up with a SQL database that is uh, here at Calst um, or if it um, at a company that maybe you uh, that you might work for. Okay. Um, so in the chat, so Farouk has a question. So is there a difference between two approaches in terms of performance to fetch the data? Um, and the answer is no. So, um, or not, um, not really, and certainly not noticeably for the, uh, the size of data that we're working with here. Um, at the end of the day, the these two approaches, whether it's using the IPython SQL extension or the uh, Zeus SQL kernel, um, both of them are just ways of getting of allowing us as users to input SQL queries that are then just going to be fed to the same SQLite database manager and executed accordingly. So most of the performance is going to be uh, the same because it's the SQLite database manager that's doing most of the work in both cases. Um, now, the Zeus SQL kernel itself is written in C++ entirely, and so it might be slightly faster than the IPython SQL kernel that we're using at the top, but those differences are going to be really minor relative to the computation, which is all being done by the same uh, SQLite database manager, which itself is a C++ program. So short answer, no. Uh, longer answer, also no. Okay. So, but good question. Thank you for, thank you for asking. Um, okay. So before we can actually uh, select some data, um, what we need to do is talk a little bit about how the data is organized in this database. So in particular, we have uh, three or four tables. So there's a person table, which has the following columns or fields, ID, personal, and family. And so this stores um, the identifying information of the person who is responsible for taking the, the readings of the data. Um, so there's a unique identifier in the ID column, and then there is a personal and a family name. Then there's a site table, which maps the sites to uh, geospatial data, so the name of the site, and then the latitude and longitude coordinates where the readings were taken. Uh, and then we have a visited table, which stores a 
um, a unique identifier, um, as well as the site and then the date that the site was visited. And notice there's some missing values in this table. So we'll talk a lot about how to handle missing values. And then the largest table is the survey table, which actually stores the reading. So there is a, a taken column, um, a person column, which looks like it has the IDs of the individuals who are responsible for taking the readings, a quant column, which looks like it is some kind of quantity that was measured, like radiation, salinity, temperature, and then the actual numeric value. Um, and so we can see there's some missing values in this table. Um, there's some positive and negative numbers. Um, but again, these are different quantities probably because the units of radiation versus salinity versus temperature are going to be different. So we'll, we'll see how we can deal with those, uh, those issues. Um, right. So we've already connected to the database. Um, so this is basically connecting to the database if you're working from a bash terminal, which we're not doing today. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, skip past this, uh, past this column. And so let's start writing some SQL queries. So at the top, so I'll do the top first. So the, the SQL query that we're going to write is um, a query to uh, display the scientist names. So we do this using what a, a SQL command called select. So we can write select. Uh, and then uh, by convention, SQL commands are, um, are written in all uppercase. And then non-SQL keywords or commands are written in lowercase, general. Um, but as we'll see, uh, SQL is case insensitive. So you can write it however, but I think you'll find it's easy to adopt the convention. So if we want to select uh, family and personal, from person. And then the semicolon is what denotes the end of a query. So that's how the SQLite database manager, when it receives this query, knows that the query is completed and ends this, this semicolon. So if we hit Shift and Enter, oh, what has happened here? Have I, I talked too long and I've lost my kernel already? Uh, well, let's see if I can get it back. Uh, discard. That looks okay. Let's try again. And okay. So if you also lost your, uh, your kernel, you can just uh, recover them by reopening the, the notebooks again. I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, so there's a question in the chat. So is it impossible to inspect the databases before you explore the information to find out how many rows and columns and things like that? Um, so that's kind of what we're going to do here using these select, uh, um, select statements to query the database. Because um, you can use uh, these kinds of commands that are discussed here to see like the list of tables um, and the list of and the, what's called the database schema, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and um, and then, but usually with the database, you have to actually write queries and send them to the query manager to find out things like how many rows and, and how many columns and, and things like that. Um, so we'll, I'll show you kind of how to answer some of these questions as we go. Uh, okay, so let's write our, um, our, whoop. Our first query. So if we do select family uh, and personal from person, and then we put a semicolon to denote the end of the query, if we hit shift and enter here, we're going to get an error. And the reason is that in this top notebook, we're using 
this is a Python notebook. So if we want um, to interpret this as SQL, we need to add the percent SQL at the beginning. And note what happens. So as soon as we add the percent SQL, we get some nice syntax highlighting here. So we have select and from are highlighted as keywords because they're SQL keywords. And now if we hit shift and enter, we get the output of the table. So we get basically the family column and the personal column, and then the, the records associated with each of those columns for the, the person table. So this is the whole person table, just these five, uh, five names. Now, here, um, we are in a SQL kernel at the bottom. So this Zeus sandbox is a SQL kernel. So we can actually just write SQL commands. So if we write select family personal from person, we don't need to prepend this percent SQL to have this interpreted as a uh, SQL command. But then of course, in the top notebook, we can intermix Python and SQL. In this bottom notebook, it's all SQL. So there will be some trade-offs. OK, so let's continue. So as I mentioned, um, the SQL itself, unlike, um, unlike Python, SQL is case insensitive. Um, and therefore, you can write you know, however you want. So like this example here, if I was to copy it uh, and paste it, will give me the same information. And if I was to do the same thing up here, I would need to prepend SQL. Um, and I'd get the same information. But I, th I think that you will agree with me that this is really hard to read, whereas this form is a lot easier to both read and also understand what parts of the, the query are the SQL keywords and what parts of the query are stuff that is specific to the database. So please, uh, today I will be writing all my queries like this and um, please don't write queries that look like this. This is very hard to read. Okay. Um, right, so uh, another bit of syntax. So again, the, you need to have the semicolon at the end of the line. So if you were to do SQL and then select um, ID from the person table, if you leave off the uh, semicolon, then this appears to work here within the notebook because they have kind of protected you against that. But in general, um, it, uh, it might not work in other SQL clients. So it's good to include the, the semicolon at the end. Um, and then down here, uh, let's see what happens. So if we do select um, ID from person and we leave off it all, this also works. So they've also made it so that you don't have to include the, the semicolon, but I would encourage you to get in the habit of including it um, because you might want to write some SQL queries uh, within these notebooks that then will get run um, in other environments. And then you would need to make sure that the semicolon was there. Okay. So there's a question in the chat. Um, is the DB uh, built in Python libraries or is it a uh, local one? So um, here, we're using, uh, so I'm not entirely sure what, um, what you mean uh, by um, this question, um, but I'll make a few comments. And then if you want to unmute, you can ask, ask your question um, again. Um, but the, the SQLite, uh, one of the reasons things that's nice about SQLite is that the database itself is just a file and you can pass that file around. So like here, I've actually saved the whole database inside the Git repo for this course for teaching purposes. And it's just a file that lives here. Many other databases 
Um, uh, many other databases um, are, are, are um, actually run on their own server and you have to log in and connect to the server to download to get access to the database. Um, but SQLite is much more lightweight as the name implies, it's just a simple file. It's actually the most widely used SQL database because it's on your mobile phone. Every, every app that you have on your mobile phone will be running SQLite of some flavor in the background as a local database to collect information before it sends it back to some larger database. So these little SQLite databases are ubiquitous and everywhere. Um, so there's another question. Uh, it's not showing anything. I ran the code, but nothing shows. Probably means that you did not run these top commands here, which actually connect to the database. So if you're using the sandbox IPI NB file, um, you'll need to run these first two lines to connect to the database. And then you should be able to get the data out. Uh, similarly, if you're using the Zeus sandbox, then you need to run the single cell at the top to connect to the database. And after that, you should be able to see the data. Okay. Um, so now, now let's try to um, understand a little bit more about the, uh, the query. So when you write a query and when the results are returned, so the rows and columns in a database, unlike a spreadsheet or unlike a CSV file, there's no inherent order to the rows and columns in a database. Like every, um, every database manager uh, or every implementation of a SQL database might have a slightly different way of storing the data internally, which means they have a different method for um, ordering or, or internally storing the rows and internally storing the columns. So um, there's no necessarily guarantee that the results you get from a database are going to be ordered in any particular way, um, unless you specifically ask for them to be ordered in a particular way, which we will do. I'll show you how to do that um, in a minute. So um, like in the queries above, we were writing select family personal from person, but you could, if you wanted to have the data come um, the other way around, you would need to say that I want to do personal and then family from person. And what has happened here? Ah, this is what, so this is the error message that you would get if you had a typo. So here I've asked for a column that doesn't exist because I mistyped personal. Okay. Um, and so the order in which you list the columns or the fields that you want in your select statement um, is the order in which they will be returned in the results. Um, okay, so you can ask for repeated columns if you want. So you could do uh, select ID 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 uh, from person, and you would just get the same column of data three times in your resulting table. Uh, there's a shortcut for selecting um, all the columns in the table. So you can do select star from the person table, and this is going to give you um, all of the columns and then all of the rows actually in the table. So if you're feeling particularly brave and you're working on a new database that you've never worked on before and you just want to see the data that's in a table as one giant table, you could write this query and it would just pull everything from that table, even if it had a million rows, a billion rows, whatever. Um, but obviously, if there were a billion rows and 100,000 columns, then um, this query would both take a while and probably crash your machine because it would run out of memory eventually to store the query results. Um, so we'll see better ways to find out information about, um, about what the table or what a table looks like and how many rows are in it, things like that. Okay. Um, so what I would, what I would like you to do 
is I'll take, I'll set a timer for, uh, th for three minutes. And I would like you to work through some of these exercises. So um, in particular, the, um, the second and the third exercises are um, on selecting, uh, practice selecting data from tables that aren't the person table. Um, and then this first one, if you, um, we didn't talk about this special dot schema command, um, but if you scroll up to uh, this section here, this um, uh, checking if data is available section. So the output of the schema command is this. And the schema gives you um, what are called create table statements, which we'll talk about later this afternoon, that explain how to create new tables in a database. And part of creating new tables in a database is that you have to provide the name for each column or field, as well as the data type, text, text, um, real, integer. So these are some of the data types that you can use in SQLite. We'll talk more about this in, in um, the next few episodes. But that see if maybe you can use this schema to go through and select columns, like try to try to select integer columns from the from the survey table, or columns whose type is integer, or try to select maybe some columns whose type is real from the site table or the survey table. Just experiment with some uh, select uh, select commands, and I will uh, briefly stop sharing my screen, and we'll set a timer. Um, and so just take a few minutes and get some practice with those, uh, those exercises and work on your select statement uh, mechanics. And I see that uh, Adiola has said that, yes, I didn't put the semicolon in front of my query in Python and it worked. Yes, so that's true. And it seems to be a, a feature of the, um, the, the notebook environment in which we're running the SQL queries. Um, in general, though, it will probably not work. And I would encourage you to always end your SQL query with a semicolon um, to be uh, you know, good practice um, for writing SQL queries.
Okay. Okay. Um, so let's pick up where we um, where we left off. Um, yeah. So let's let's pick up where we left off. Um, sorry, just a second. I'm trying to get. Okay. So just some more examples before we move on of, of select statements. So if you wanted to um, select some columns that contain image, uh, integers, um, so the columns that contained integers, if we would go back up here and look at the schema. So uh, one of the columns that contained uh, integers was the taken, um, uh, from the server, it was the taken column from the survey table. So if we do, um, so we're in the IPython notebook, so SQL uh, select uh, taken from the survey table. That would be one way to do it. Um, another integer column is the ID from the, uh, from the visited table. So if we did select um, ID, from visited table. So that will select all these visited. Um, if we wanted to select um, both the columns that are numerical data types from the survey table, so that would be the taken column and the reading column. So we would do that with um, select taken and reading from the survey team, something like this. Okay, so more examples of uh, select statements. Uh, so just to wrap up this episode before moving on. Um, so uh, relational databases store information in tables. Um, each of these tables has a fixed set of columns and a variable number of records. So the database schema um, for each table will explain exactly the number of columns that are in that table and then what varies is the records. Changing the number of columns in a database table is not easy. Adding new records to a database is very easy. Um, so a database manager is the program that manipulates the information that's stored in the database. So when we write SQL queries, this is the special language that we use to communicate with the database manager who then runs off and figuratively extracts the data from the database and gives it to us. And we've seen the select from uh, statement where we're selecting columns from a table. Okay. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a minute. There looks like there's some stuff in um, Um, in the chat. Um, okay. Um, okay. So there's been several questions about these special dot commands, dot schema, dot tables. I have, I have entirely ignored them um, um, in part because I don't really use them myself. Um, but there seems to be some confusion because they won't work within the, the notebook environment. Um, so I will show you how you can run these commands and get them to work. So let's, let's just go ahead and do that now. Um, okay. So these special uh, SQLite commands like that are discussed here um, in this section, checking if data is available, will only work from within a, uh, the SQLite console running from within a bash terminal. And it's kind of a, mm, it's not a great way uh, to use the um, uh, sorry, it's not a great way to to necessarily to use the uh, SQLite. Um, so I will show you, but I'll show you how to do it just in case, um, just so you know. 
So if we navigate in the file browser to the introduction to SQL directory, oops, didn't mean to do that. So um, introduction to SQL. And if we click on the, the launcher button here, and our, let's just put this launcher up here. So we can scroll down and we can launch a, uh, a terminal. Okay, so now uh, within this terminal, um, we can run, get out of this now. So uh, within this terminal, this is where we did all of our work in our bash. So when we were in working in bash, we were running commands in this terminal. So if we run pwd to see where we are, so we're in our home directory. Um, and if we run ls to see what's in the home directory, so we can see here's our introduction to SQL directory. So if we cd into the introduction to SQL directory, now if we run ls again, we'll see that we have um, the same information that we have here. Okay. Um, so now what we can do is we can run um, this command here to connect to the database. So SQLite and then, and then, but we need to run, provide the path to the director, to the file where the directory, or sorry, the file, the database file. So our database file lives in the data directory. So if we do ls data, so there's our survey.db file. So the command that we need to run is SQLite3 followed by the path to the database, which is survey.db. Now, when you run this, now you'll be dropped into this SQLite console, which as you can see, looks like is instructed in teaching notes. And then you can use these doc commands. So if you do doc tables, you'll see that here is the name of the tables. Um, if you do dot schema, you'll get the, um, the create table statements when we'll talk about those later. Um, there's a dot help menu, which tells you some other special commands that, that you can run. Um, and, then, um, and then of course in here, we could write SQL queries as well. So we could write, uh, select star from person semicolon, and then we get the results back. And as you can see, this is not nearly as nicely formatted as the type of, of results that we were getting from within the notebook. Um, the teaching notes mention how you can clean this up a little bit using the dot mode command um, to change the formatting of the columns and the dot header command to turn on the headers. And so then if we ran the same command again, we'd get better formatted output. Um, but I hope just in this kind of quick me walking through these commands, you would see that this way of working from within the terminal, I think is, is, is uh, clearly um, uh, inferior to working inside of the notebooks themselves. And in fact, I, I never run SQL commands from the command line. I always connect to a database from a notebook and then run either um, using the IPython SQL um, uh, command um, followed by the SQL, because I often like to intermix my Python and SQL commands in the same notebook. Um, I'm testing out this new Zeus uh, SQL kernel just to see how it goes. Uh, it's, it's very new um, and, and growing in popularity. So I kind of wanted to experiment a little bit, make you guys aware of it. Um, but it's kind of why I'm not stressing too much these special dot uh, SQL commands, SQLite commands. Um, uh, the other issue is that uh, in the near future, they will probably be supported within the notebooks. It just, it hasn't been a, a development priority for the teams working on this. And if you want to get out of the SQLite console, I think it's dot exit is the command and that takes you back to the bash prompt. Okay. So that's the quick tutorial of how to access SQLite from a command line, um, explaining how to use the dot 
special SQLite dot commands. Um, but that's, uh, unless there are quick questions in chat, that's the last I'll say of it. Um, oh, okay, oh, so Didier has a good question. Does the Zeus notebook auto-complete the SQL commands? Um, I don't know. Well, let's, uh, so let's, let's see. So if I was to type um, SEL and hit tab, so I'm hitting tab and it does not appear to be auto-completing unless it's taking a while. So I would say no, it doesn't look like it supports autocomplete. And then I'm guessing that um, if you did SQL, yeah, there, there's no autocomplete here um, for SQL commands. But that would be kind of a cool feature. Um, okay, so moving on to the next uh, the next episode. Sorting and removing duplicates. So I'm going to go in here and add um, sorting and removing duplicates. And the same here. So here I'm just using the features of the notebooks to add um, some little markdown cells to just kind of break up the notebook a little bit into the sections that we're covering. So both of these notebooks I'm going to uh, download and save um, and then re-upload to GitHub. So you'll have a record of all the commands that I run today. Um, sorting and removing duplicates. So we're going to talk about how to sort a query's results. So I, I mentioned earlier that query results, the rows that are returned are not necessarily returned in any particular order. In fact, the order in which they return might change from query to query unless we specifically describe how we want the results to be returned. So we'll talk about that in this episode. And we'll talk about how to remove duplicate values uh, from a query's results. And then we'll write some more queries that do those things. Okay. So we're working with this data from this Antarctic expedition, and we want to know what kind of measurements were taken at each site, and then which scientists took the measurements on that, ex, uh, on that particular expedition. So measurements, um, to answer the first question, measurements taken at which site, we can look at the survey table. Um, so let's do uh, select quant. Um, from survey. So these are the uh, quantity measurements that were taken at each site. So there's this radiation, salinity, more radiation, but there's a lot of duplicates in here and it's not clear like how many, you know, if this had a million values, it's not clear how many of them are unique. So what are the different measurements taken? So basically we've got some duplicates and can we, um, can we get rid of this? And uh, the answer is yes. So um, we could write a query using the distinct keyword. So the distinct keyword will remove the duplicate values from the column or field that you're asking for. And so now you can see actually there's only three unique values in that table, radiation, salinity, and temperature. Now we knew that because the data set is small enough that we actually looked at the whole tables when we started, um, when I started teaching. Um, and, but in general, you would never be able to look at the whole table in, in one go. And so this is how you would find how many unique values are uh, in a particular column. Um, you can look for um, distinct sets of values. So if we wanted to look for um, how many distinct um, taken quantity pairs, because remember the, uh, the taken um, is determines like which visit. So the ID, the integer in the taken column determines which particular visit um, was it which the quantities were, um, were measured. So we can get distinct pairs of values by just adding. So if we did uh, select taken quant from survey, if we did this, 
this would just be selecting the two columns from the survey table. And there's a lot of duplicates in here. If we wanted distinct pairs, we just add the distinct keyword in front of the, the two columns, and then we get distinct pairs. So we can see that um, on visit 619, radiation and salinity was measured. On 622, the same, radiation and salinity. On visit 734, all three, um, all three values were measured and so forth. Um, okay, so that was the duplicates. So now let's look at um, um, how to order. So if we just did a standard select statement to select everything from uh, the person table, and here I need to add, so if we did that, then, um, uh, then we get these back, but they're not in any particular order. So if instead what we wanted to do was um, order them, we can use an order by uh, clause. So we can do order by, and then we can add a column whose values we would like to order. So if we do order by ID, then the rows will be re returned sorted by the values in the ID column. In this case, the ID is a text column, so it will be sorted alphabetically um, from lowest to highest. Um, now, if we wanted to get the opposite ordering, um, so if we wanted to order uh, instead of ID, if we wanted to order by, um, by family name, but in descending order, then we can add this uh, descending uh, or de uh, des um, for descending. Um, and then lastly, if you wanted to be, and so you can see how that has sorted by the family column, but in reverse alphabetical order. Um, and if you wanted to be specific um, and always um, put whether you're sorting in ascending or descending order, you could do something like just add ASC for ascending. And that's the default setting for ordering. But if you wanted to be explicit and always include the way that you want to do the ordering, um, you can do that. Um, so if it's important um, that your results of your SQL query get returned in a predictable order, then you should choose um, a column or columns uh, by which to order the results always. So if you want the SQL query to return results in a consistent predictable order, you should always add uh, explicitly an order by clause. OK. Um, so you can sort by um, you can sort by multiple columns. So um, so this example is so if we were to select uh, taken person and quantity from the survey table, and then we were going to order by uh, taken, and we were going to order first by taken in ascending order and then by person in descending order, we could write a query like this. And so then it would select these three columns. First, it would sort by taken in ascending order. So since taken is an integer column, it's going to be sorting first from lowest to highest, the integers in the taken column. And then within those, it will then sort by person descending. Uh, so for example, here, since these taken in person is the same in both these first four records, if you come down to rec these three records here, you can see that they all had the same value for taken, but now we've sorted them alphabetically um, in descending order um, for the values in the person column. And so here, th this query is starting to get a bit long. And so um, one of the things that you'll see is you'll often see queries kind of broken up um, like as follows. So you might have a select um, statement on the first line and then maybe an order by statement on the second line. And 
to kind of keep the query from being this one line run, run on long query, you kind of break it up visually. And this will give you the same thing. Now, um, there's a new bit of syntax in the IPython um, uh, SQL in that this percent SQL is necessary, uh, or the percent SQL says interpret this single line as SQL. Um, and then allows you to write like some other line, which might be like actual Python code or something. So this will run this SQL command and then run some Python calculation. Yeah. So if you want to have multiple lines of SQL, then you need to do percent percent SQL and then this will interpret the entire everything in the whole cell as SQL, no matter how many lines are there. So then you could do something like this. So um, as we go forward today, I'll almost always start doing this, the using the cell magic command percent percent SQL, as opposed to the line magic command with the single percent because our queries are just going to get longer and longer as they get more complicated and it's going to make sense to break them up visually. Okay. Um, so this query here is telling us, you know, which scientists, so that's the person column measured which quantity on which visit. Right, so that, that's some, some useful information. Um, so we might wonder, well, you know, did certain scientists specialize in measuring certain things? Like, was there one scientist who always did the radiation measurements or another scientist who always did the, um, uh, the salinity measurements or, or things like that? So we could get at this by um, using our distinct keyword again. So if we um, looked at uh, distinct person quantity pairs, and then um, uh, we're not, probably doesn't make sense to order by these columns anymore. So then if we ordered by uh, quantity ascending, so then this is giving us basically the distinct combinations of um, scientists and quantity. So it looks like actually for radiation, um, there were four different scientists that measured radiation at one point or another. And then uh, different scientists measured salinity as well. There's some missing value for salinity. And then uh, temperature had different scientists as well. So it doesn't really look like the different scientists specialized in measuring different things. Everybody seemed to be kind of measuring every, every quantity. Okay, so um, I wanna give you a few minutes to work on some exercises. So I'll go ahead and start a timer. Um, so practice the distinct keyword uh, to find some distinct dates from the visited table. Um, and then um, practice um, displaying some names and ordering by uh, family name and things like that. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the next episode. Okay. So I set my timer. And so uh, feel free to ask questions uh, or otherwise I'll just sit here and sip my tea. give you guys some time to work. And actually, so we've been going for about uh, an hour and a half now. So this might be a good opportunity to take a little kind of mini break. Um, so we'll take a maybe a five minute break um, and then we'll uh, return with the, the next episode. So a slightly longer break this time, maybe if uh, people need a bio break or
a such thing. So I'll go ahead and pause the recording now and we'll, we'll pick it up in uh, five minutes time. Okay, so we're back. Um, nice quick break. So let's move on. So are there any questions about distinct or order by? Um, and if, if not, then we'll just move on to the next um, uh, the next episode. Okay, cool. Well, let's move move right along. Uh, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so the next episode is on filtering. So how to um, how to filter out uh, certain rows from a query. So let's add filtering and I'll add another one. Filtering. Okay. Um, so this is going to be like uh, data subsetting. So if we, um, if you came to the pandas, uh, not the pandas training, the Python training uh, a couple of weeks ago where we use pandas to do similar kinds of tasks with data. Um, we talked a lot about how to select subsets of data in different ways. And filtering is kind of how you subset data in SQL. Um, so you do this using a where clause. So, um, so I'll use this uh, cell magic for, uh, for this query. So if we were to select all the columns from the visited table. And then we could put on a, on a second line, we could put where, and now this is where we, we write a statement on, um, um, on what values uh, have to be in certain columns, for example. So we only want to select those records or rows from the visited table where the site column takes the value uh, dr1, dr-1. So these are like only rows that are associated with that particular site. We want to have the results returned. And if we evaluate that, uh, I've lost my kernel again. So try that again and I will that again, and I bet that my, yeah, so my SQL magic is not found anymore. So when I lost my kernel during the break, that means I need to go back up here and reload the extension and reconnect to the database. And then similarly, I'll have to do the same here. I'll have to reload the database. Um, but now these commands should work again. Yeah. Okay, not quite sure why my kernels are not being as stable as they uh, as they usually are, but it's okay. So uh, no no such table visited. Yes, indeed, there is no such table visited. That's a typo. Okay, and so now instead of getting the entire table, we get only three rows where the site value matches. Um, what we've requested here. Uh, let's go back here, filtering. Okay. Um, you know, if we wanted to, we could select only a particular column. So we could do select only the ID column from the visited table where site is dr-1. And note that I'm using single quotes here, not double quotes. So that's important because um, single quotes and double quotes, um, unlike in Python, where as long as you're consistent and you use single quotes or double quotes, it's fine. Here, I'm pretty sure that this is not going to work. Oh, it does work. Hmm. This is something else that might only work in a notebook, but then might not work in the um, in the from the command line, the bash terminal. So, 
tend to get in the habit of using single quotes. Okay. Save this. Okay, so let's look at uh, this draw. This diagram um, explains how the database manager is going to execute this query and understanding how the database manager executes queries is very important as you become a more advanced uh, writer of SQL queries because the way in which you structure your queries can dramatically impact the performance um, in terms of how fast the results will be returned. And so it's good to understand the order in which SQL, um, uh, SQL queries are executed. So in particular, this where clause is the first thing that is executed. So the database manager will go through all the records in the database table and it will ask the question, does this record satisfy this, well, does this record satisfy this condition where site equals dr1? If it does, then I'm going to keep it. If it doesn't, I'm going to ignore it. And so it will go through all the records in the table to filter out only those rows that satisfy the condition and then it will select the columns or fields from that subset that you asked for. So we can use multiple Boolean uh, operators to filter data. So if we wanted to select um, all the columns from the visited, visited table where uh, site is dr1 and the dated column is less than uh, 190101. So we can use and or or uh, logical uh, operators to join together several uh, Boolean conditions into a single Boolean condition that can be used to filter. Um, so now we're, we've seen our first example of a date uh, in SQLite. It's a good time to talk about data types. Um, so most database managers have their own kind of special data type for uh, modeling uh, dates and times. Uh, SQLite does not. It uses strings um, and, and it stores them generally as text or as, well, it stores them as either text or real numbers. And if it stores them as text, it uses the ISO uh, 8601 standard format, which is this here. So this format, um, or it uses um, real numbers to store time using the Julian calendar, um, which is really not intuitive. Um, or then integers, which measures the, is like Unix time, um, which measures the number of seconds since midnight. So there are three different ways um, to model uh, date times and using SQLite. Um, most other database managers will have built in date time, uh, special date time data types for modeling, uh, modeling date and time. Um, for me, the, the, the two that I would usually consider would be either the text, which is probably the most intuitive and human readable, um, or integers to measure seconds since midnight, January 1, 1970, because that's the Unix, the way of measuring time in Unix systems, um, which are more common. I would probably not use real numbers because that the Julian calendar is really not intuitive, I think. Um, but you have three options. Um, okay, so let's see an example of an, of an OR query. Um, so if we wanted to find all the information from the survey table, uh, and I need to do my SQL cell magic, uh, where uh, person is lake or person is row. So this is, is asking for all the information from the survey table 
where the scientist who was associated with that information is ID'd by Lake or ID'd by Row. And these are their unique identifiers. Right. And so again, notice that there's no order or anything like that. We didn't have an order by statement that ordered this, this scientist. Um, there's another way that you can do this. Uh, you could ask the same type of question. Um, so instead of saying where person equals lake or person equals row, you could use the in keyword to say person in, and then you provide a list of, um, of options. If you want to think of it that way. And this will give you the, the same results. Okay. Um, so you can combine um, Boolean operators and an or, um, but you have to be careful about ordering and you should be explicit maybe in your use of parentheses if, if you're not entirely sure how, um, if you wanna be unambiguous. So select star from the survey table where the quantity involved is salinity and the person who took the measurement is lake or person is row. Now, um, if we don't use uh, parentheses or anything, then these are just going to be done from left. It's going to be uh, the, the Boolean condition will be constructed from left to right. So it will first do um, the quantity is salinity and the person equals lake or anything that is associated with the person equal row, which is not what we want, right? So the best thing to do is to use parentheses to make it explicit the order in which we want this to be, the query to be evaluated. So we first, we want this to be evaluated and then we want this to be evaluated. So it's just like when you're doing uh, conditional statements with Python and there's some ambiguity, you want to eliminate the ambiguity by um, using, by explicit use of parentheses. So here we're getting all, so you note that all the quantities are salinity. Whereas if we were to remove the parentheses, then we would get different query results and probably not the query results that we intend. So example here, we'd get this radiation measurement taken also by row, but we didn't want that. Okay. Um, so you can also do like partial matching. Um, there's a keyword called like, where um, if you want to do a partial match on a string, uh, you could do, for example, um, Let's get rid of this. So if you wanted to pattern match and say basically anything that started with dr dash and it could be one, two, three, 99, I don't know, any, anything, then you could put a percent and um, whoop, that didn't seem to work as intended. Um, aha, of course, because I'm not using the, uh, the like keyword. So this does like a pattern matching kind of thing. And so matches, so you can see here that there are multiple sites, dr-1, dr-3, that match that pattern. So we get all of those results returned. Just take a quick look at the chat. Um, so there's a question about uh, order by. So if I have an order by, will it be executed after the select? Yes. So the order by, it would be the last thing that would be executed because that is going to determine the order of the results. And that doesn't need to be done until the subset of results that we need has been identified. So order by will execute after the select. I think I'll have some more. I think I have some examples of, of 
that uh, later in the teaching notes. There's another question. So what if the date is stored in a format like uh, a non-standard format, like 29 November 2020? Um, how to uh, filter the data like that? Um, so in that, in that case, um, you would have to be very careful in how you um, in how you uh, handle the data. So what I might do in the case that, so the question is what happens if your date time, you've created a SQLite database, um, but the, the string format of the date does not match this, uh, this standard format. So um, in that case, what I might do, depending on the size of the data, is I might, um, well, pragmatically, I might just down, I, I might um, filter data on time on timestamps by extracting the data from SQLite into pandas. And I'll show you how to do that later this afternoon. And then using pandas to um, load this non-standard, a non-standard date time string representation into a proper date time data type and then working with that. Um, and otherwise I might try to um, write some code that would properly format the data um, and then so change the date time formatting to be the correct standard format um, and then um, create a new table that had the correctly formatted date time data, something like this. Um, okay, good question. So we did like, um, so we could do even more filtering. So we can combine uh, our distinct keywords. So if we did select um, person and quant, from the survey table where person is lake or person equals row. And if we run this, we'll see that there's quite a, a fair amount of duplicates. Um, and of course we can get rid of the duplicates by using the distinct keyword. So things like that. Um, okay, so growing queries. So um, growing queries is a way of kind of writing SQL queries. And I've been practicing it um, as we go along without really talking about what it is, but it's basically you start with a simple query, um, like uh, select star from uh, some table. Uh, and then you slowly, you iterate on this query by looking at the results and then adding more and more and more elaborate um, additional statements to the query until you arrive at the result that you want. Um, and you, you typically do this um, for a couple of reasons. So one, um, unless you're very experienced, it's often hard to just boom, write down a SQL query that, that does what you want. Um, but sometimes for really complicated queries, it's the only strategy that, that will work. And so what you'll need to do is, you know, if you have a really large database, like maybe you, um, you know, we haven't shown you the limit keyword yet, but there's a limit keyword where you can select like five records from a column and from our a table and all of the columns. So you could select out a smaller subset of the data and then start working on, um, on applying your additional more advanced uh, query statements or clauses rather to build up this more complicated SQL query. And then when you're done, you can remove the limit and run the query on the whole uh, table or the multiple tables if you're doing something else. Um, so this growing queries, well, I'm gonna be doing this a lot as we get to more complicated queries with joins and, and things like that. Um, but 
it's uh, it's kind of a strategy for writing SQL queries. Okay. Um, so let's just get rid of that. Okay, so I want to give you some time to work on some exercises. So let's take just a few minutes um, and have a look at these queries. So this first one, there's something wrong with this query. And so they wanna see if you can fix it um, and then try to write a query that is um, that fixes the issue that's identified here. Um, and then there is, you write it, can you write a query that would find outliers? So that's a very common thing that you would want to do when working with data is you want to find some outliers. So, you know, you could download the, the data from, from SQL into a pandas data frame and do analysis in pandas to get the answer, but you could also do that just directly in SQL. So let's see if you can write a query that will identify some outliers. And then this last exercise is kind of tests um, uh, your pattern matching uh, understanding. So take a few minutes and have a look at those exercises. And I will uh, stop sharing my screen for the moment. And then we can, um, I'll, show some, I'll show some of the solutions and then we'll move on to the next episode. All right, so my timer is set. Okay, so, so I gave a few minutes to look at those exercises. So what I'll do now is uh, I'll work through this finding outliers. So the normalized salinity readings are supposed to be between zero and one. So write a query that selects all records from survey with salinity values outside this range. This would be like the outliers. So I will grow this query. So we'll start with uh, select star from the survey table. Okay. And so we're looking for outliers um, 
for salinity in particular. So we only um, care about the uh, maybe the quantity and the reading, not taken or person. Um, but in particular, we only care about uh, those records where quant is equal to salinity. And now we want to identify any particular outliers. So we can see that there are a few outliers in here. Um, so we we'll probably need to have an, um, an and uh, condition. So and um, reading is less than zero or reading is greater than one. So these would, salinity reading should never be negative and should always be less than one because they're supposed to be like a, um, a percentage or a, a proportion. Um, and, and remember, we need to be explicit about this because otherwise we get where uh, quantity is salinity and reading is less than one or anything where we had reading greater than zero, which is not what we want. So we need to be explicit and make sure we use parentheses properly. And so that pulls out these two, um, uh, these two possible records. Okay, so in this episode, we saw um, how to use where to specify conditions that records must meet in order to be included. So this is a filtering um, and or, uh, we didn't talk about not, um, but not uh, is the other logical operator that you can use um, uh, in these types of conditions. And um, so filtering is done, and also filtering is done on the whole record. So you can filter on conditions that aren't displayed. So for example, um, I could leave off uh, quantity and I could still filter on the quantity, even though I'm not displaying quantity as a result. And that goes back to um, the schematic here that the where, the, the where part of the query operates on the entire data table, including all the fields and filters out those records that satisfy that condition. And only then will it execute the select state. So, okay. Um, so can we define, define the outlier by more than the average? So that's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes. And either in this next episode or the one after that, we'll talk about uh, mathematical computations that you can do in SQL. So in order to, um, in order to uh, write a query that did what you're asking, so can we define an outlier to be more than average? Um, we need to have, we need to know how to use functions like mean, um, for example, and to calculate the mean of some values. Um, so we'll see how to do that in just a minute. Okay. So let's, in fact, it should be in this episode here. Okay, um, so just kind of looking ahead, um, I want, before I get started on this, so we are about uh, two hours in and we have about two hours to go. And so we are about here. And so I'm going to do this, uh, this calculating new values and, and then we're gonna take a break and then we will do, uh, um, the second half of, of the course. So we'll take like a 15 or 20 minute break um, after I cover this uh, calculating new values episode. Okay, so in this episode, we're gonna see how to calculate new values on the fly. And then we'll see how we can use um, calculated values um, 
as part of selecting records and things like that. So that will answer the question that um, uh, was just asked. And I seem to have lost my kernel again. So I'm going to have to go back up here and rerun these um, commands to connect the database. Okay. Um, okay, so just as an example, so after looking through the expedition logs, we realized the radiation measures they report were wrong. So they need to be corrected upwards by 5%. Um, so rather than modifying the stored data, like going in and manually recreating the data and bumping up the, um, the radiation measurements, we can calculate this on the fly. So we could do something like as follows. So we could um, select um, 1.05 times the reading from the survey table where the quant is equal to radiation. And so that will take our um, the reading column where quant equals radiation and then multiply the value by 1.05. So that's just 5% higher than, um, than the previous value. Uh, we can you know, do even more. Um, so for example, if we wanted to convert the, um, the temperature readings um, from, so if the quant is temperature, so here the temperature is uh, stored in Fahrenheit. And so if we wanted to convert those temperature readings to Celsius, then we would need to, knowing the formula to do the conversion, we could just take the Celsius, um, the Fahrenheit temperature, select or subtract off 32, um, multiply by five, divide by nine, and then we could use, uh, so we could do this, and maybe we want the taken column as well. So we could do this, and if we wanted to, we could round, we could use a built-in function called round to round the overall result to two decimal places. And at this point, I would probably want to use a cell magic. So you could do something like this. Now, um, as this, so you've probably noticed that because there is no header or column or field name for a value that you're calculating on the fly, it just takes the string representation of the formula, which is a bit unwieldy. But we can actually um, use an as keyword to rename this field. So we could call this, um, Celsius, for example. And then we would get the result out as Celsius. Um, right. You can also, so there's other operators that you can use with strings. Um, so if we wanted to do select uh, personal and family from person, so if we wanted to actually combine these uh, personal and family name into a single result, which is like their full name, um, there is uh, a concatenation operator, which is two pipe characters, followed by um, the character that you want to add to do the concatenation. Um, actually, I'll just leave that out. So if we do this, so we have, there's no, um, no space or anything by default. It just smushes the personal and the family name together. Um, so we could improve this using as, um, and then we could say um, as full name or as uh, I'll just call it name. But if we wanted to put a space in there, we would need to use um, concatenate personal with 
a white space and concatenate that with family. And then we could add a space in there. Okay. So let's take um, a few minutes. So take three minutes and have a look at these exercises. So more practice with you know, running kind of com computing things in um, 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 using operators and things like that, uh, mathematical operators and whatnot. So get some practice with that. Um, there's an interesting exercise on union, which is a keyword that shows you how to combine the results of one query with the results of a second query. Um, and you can have a, a play around with that. Um, and then there is um, another episode, or an, another kind of um, uh, exercise that uses some built-in functions called in-string and substring to um, manipulate strings, basically. So some more advanced exercises here. And again, the solutions to all of these you can find by just uh, you know, touching the down arrow and you'll get the full solution. So I'll, I'll set my, my timer for, uh, for three minutes. And then um, I'll see if anyone has any questions. And then if not, then we'll have a, um, a 20 minute break and we'll reconvene at 3.30. Um, for the second half of the uh, intro to SQL course. Okay, uh, any last minute questions about the, the exercises or this episode? And if not, we'll, we'll take a break and I'll see you again at 3.30. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna pause the recording now and I'll see you again in about 20 minutes. Resume the recording, share my screen. Okay. So in the previous episode, we talked, we, showed, we saw some examples of how to do mathematical calculations and kind of compute stuff on the fly. Um, in this uh, episode, we're gonna talk about uh, missing data. Okay. Um, 
so we're going to talk about how how databases uh, represent missing information and then um, what special handling does missing information require like what do you have to do to handle missing information properly um, and then we'll see basically um, how to do all of those things in particular we're going to talk about three valued logic um, which is how databases think through how to return results when there's missing uh, missing values okay so um, if you if you have done any work with real world data so not necessarily curated academic data sets that are already cleaned and neat and tidy where they've handled all these issues if you've worked with real world data you'll know that it's never complete there's always missing data there's always you know uh, corrupt data there's always things that you have to deal with um, and so databases represent these represent missing data or holes in the data set using a special value called null. So null is not zero, it's not false or an empty string. It is a special value. And the best way to think about what null means is that it means there's nothing there. So it's a hole in the data. So um, dealing with null requires some special tricks and careful thinking. Um, so let's uh, let's see some examples. So if we were to uh, select star from the uh, visited table, and I can see because of the Python syntax highlighting that I am not <coughs> using the SQL magic command. So we can see here that there's a hole in the data. So it's none or null. So let's see what happens if we do, and so this is a missing date. So let's see what happens if we do uh, the same query. And we say, but we add a where clause. So where the dated column is less than um, 1930.01.01. So before January uh, um, 1st, 1930. OK. And so you can see here there are two values that are returned. So there were two. So these two are from 1927. And so those were returned. So what if we do the opposite <clears throat> and ask, well, what happens if we ask for uh, data that's greater than or equal to uh, where the dated column has a date that comes after or equal to January 1st, 1930. And you'll see we get these four values. But so we got four values, or sorry, five values from this query, two values from this query, that's seven in total. But we know that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, records in the table. So this is that three value logic that I mentioned. So when the database manager sees this filter as part of your query, it's going to go through and check each record and ask, is this filter evaluate to true? And so the answer would be um, yes. So this date is less than 1930.01.01. This date is less than 1930.01.01. And then it would be no, no, no. And then when it sees this missing value, it says figuratively, I don't know. And if the answer is not yes, so no or I don't know are, are not included in the results. And similarly, when you ask for this filter, when, it, when the database manager reaches the record with the missing value, basically says, I don't know. And so it doesn't include it in the results. So data with missing values are automatically excluded from, uh, from the results of where clauses. Um, Right. So um, you might think, OK, well, what if I want to find some missing values? So if you do um, select star from the visited 
uh, where dated uh, equals null. That gives you the empty set. And you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense because I know that there is a missing value here. Why is it not returning that? Um, and similarly, you might think, okay, well, surely this should return some data. And you know, that doesn't even return data. So you might have thought that using dated not equal to null would return everything else, but that's not the way null is, is, um, is a, a special own unique value and just doesn't work with these kinds of operations. It has a special value or a special keyword is. So select star from visited where dated is null will give you the result that you were probably looking for. And similarly, if you wanted to have everything um, where dated is not null, you would write it like this, it is not null. And that would give you all those records. Okay. So um, null values or mi missing values, you know, can they just have to be dealt with? So they can cause headaches, but they just they have to be dealt with. And um, and as long as you know that the missing value that you might have some missing values and you can anticipate that, then you can you can write your queries um, to protect against that. So for example, um, in the survey table. So let's look at the survey table. So the survey table has some missing values in the person column. So there are some uh, measurements for salinity and temperature whose values we know, but we simply just don't know what the scientist, um, the, the name of the scientist or the identifier of the scientist that took those readings. So um, if you then said, okay, well, let's do select star um, survey where quant is salinity and person not equal lake. So you wanted all of the results for the salinity measurement for scientists not uh, named Lake, you would get these four. Whether or not you would want to include these null values, um, it kind of depends on, on what you want. So for example, if you were happy to basically say, well, you know, I, I do want the null values in this query, then the way that you would write it would be to have use and and or together and say, I want all of the salinity measurements for people for a person not named Lake or where the person is not. And then that would include uh, that null value uh, for the salinity measure. Um, Now, whether that's the right thing to do or not kind of depends on, on again, what, what it is that you're trying to, to do and how you want to use the data. Um, so uh, we haven't yet seen examples of built-in functions like min, max, and average, but they all ignore null values. And this is generally what you want. Um, so when we are trying to average values with a null, we don't want the null value to corrupt the, the calculation. We just want it to be silently ignored. And so that will happen. And we're gonna see that in the next section where we talk about aggregation functions. Okay, so um, let's take uh, a few minutes and have a, have a go at these exercises. Um, so here's an example, there's some examples of, of queries where um, 
you know, think about, so we used this in operator earlier. Um, so what do you think that this query is going to be? And then what result does it produce and see if you, um, you know, you guess right or see if it, um, and then write um, some query sorting by known date um, and practice including the, um, um, including and excluding null values basically. All right, so I'm just going to briefly stop sharing. Ah. Um, so Didier asked a, gr a very good question. So can we fill in the null values instead of discarding them so it does not corrupt the operation? So, um, so that's called imputing uh, missing values. Um, and so Yes, you you can do that. Um, I would typically not. That's so. That's an example of an operation that I would typically not do in SQL. So what? And the reason that I would I would do that is that I would not do it in SQL. Is that if you think about where um, where getting data out of SQL or out of databases fits in the larger scheme of doing data science and machine learning. So your data might live in this relational database. And then the ultimate output is going to be some prediction from a machine learning model. And in between is going to be a machine learning model pipeline. The first part of that pipeline is going to be data ingestion, followed by some probably some feature engineering, model training, things like that. Usually when you're doing the, um, the step after you uh, ingest the data from like a SQL database or something like that, then you want to do your data imputation. So if you're going to fill in missing values, that's where I would do it. And this is why if you look at like, uh, so next week, we're going to talk about scikit-learn um, and doing machine learning in scikit-learn. We'll see some examples of filling in missing values. Um, and that's when I would do it. So I would, if I knew that there were, um, if I, if I knew that there was missing values in the SQL database, I would write a query that would explicitly include the records with missing values in my output of the query. So I wouldn't drop them from the query results. I would explicitly ask to be to include those missing uh, records uh, in the results. And then later, when I got to the scikit-learn stage of my, my modeling pipeline, I would decide whether I actually really did want to drop them or maybe I could fill them in with averages or mean or modes or, or something else. Okay, and then there's a question about, um, so I will put, Okay. Um, any uh, any questions about the? Exercises. So I think what I will do, so let me share my screen. Is so oh, let's Okay, so let's take a look at this query. So if you kind of naively looked at this query, you might expect that what is going to happen is that you're going to, just like we used this in uh, keyword earlier and we had two strings in here, 
and we had that time it was it was names I think like Lake and Roe, and then it returned uh, records from the visited table where the name was either one or the other options in the set. Um, but here, oh, I lost my kernel again. I don't know why the I keep losing my kernel. But you just go back up here and, and select it. And then I have to go back up and reload the database when every time that happens. And then I'll go back here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and but here again, we're not showing the missing values. And that's because um, that's because null is not a member of the set basically so things that match null are going to be ignored so the way that you would want to write this query and, and this this example would be to say that you want uh, dates where date is equals this particular string or um is null and oh, or um sorry or dated is null and then this would give the result that you wanted. So, gen so I guess the, the rule is that when you want, if you if you want to include null results, you're probably going to need a is null somewhere in your query. Okay. Let's move on to the next aggregation. Um, so now we're uh, we're going to learn how to use built-in functions to do some calculations like doing sums and averages and um, other kinds of like summary statistics and computations in um, in SQL. Okay. So let's look at uh, work down here. So let's work at um, the the visited table. So we have all these dates. And now we're going to select, use an aggregation function to collapse all of these values into a single value. Because that's what an aggregation does. It takes, it aggregates a lot of values into a single value. So in particular, if we do uh, select um, min of dated from visited, we get a single value, the earliest date. We could do, again, we could do max, and we'll get the latest date. But notice that, like, the, these, remember that dated is stored as a string. So the only way that we can actually use min and max on strings that are dates and get the expected result is if we follow the convention of formatting our date times using the ISO standard. If you use some other kind of formatting, there's no net, there's no guarantee that the min and the max would work as expected. So make sure your date times are properly formatted. And um, so here is a, a, a schematic of how that query is executed. So first the select uh, statement is executed. So from the visited table, we select the particular column, the dated column that we want, and then we apply the aggregation function to that column to produce a single value. Um, so another one, uh, select, we could do the average uh, reading from the survey table. where uh, the quantity in question is salinity. And then we'll get this, uh, this result. 
and again, earlier we saw an even another function where there was a built-in function called round, where we could round the result to some number of decimal places. So we could do that as well. Um, if we wanted to know how many um, uh, how many rows were in a particular output, we could do let's count um, readings from the survey table where quant is equal to salinity. So this is actually giving us the number of records in the table where uh, this is true. And so actually there's a, um, a handy way to count the number. There's a question very early on about, well, how do we know how many rows are in our, our table? Well, one way to do it would be to do select star from the table in question. And then you can actually just do uh, count star. And then that tells you basically how many rows are in the, the table. So this is usually one of the first queries that I run when I'm, I'm working with a new SQL database and a new table is I'll run this query, select count star from some table. And then that will tell me how many uh, rows are in the uh, are in the table. Um, you can do multiple aggregations at once. So if we wanted to do, um, I haven't done an aggregation up here yet. So let's do an aggregation up here. So if we were to do uh, the min value of reading the max value of reading. Let's even insert the average reading and maybe the count of reading. And from the survey table, where quantity is equal to salinity and because we know there are some outliers we want to make sure that we exclude any outliers from these calculations uh, reading is less than or equal to one and actually the readings are supposed to be between zero and one so we could even be more specific and say uh, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. And then we get, so these are like descriptive statistics. So there are seven records for the salinity that are um, not outliers and um, ignoring the outliers, the uh, our, the minimum reading is uh, 0 0.05 and the max reading is 0 0.21 and the average is is this. So if we were to, um, you know, just to show you that there's a difference. So if we were to get rid of that, notice that we get nine now. So there were two other records that we had excluded and now the numbers have completely changed. In particular, we can see that this max is huge, which is not, uh, um, which is not quite right. So we'll put that back in. Okay. So this is the type of SQL query that, remember when we were working with pandas in our, our Python course, we were doing, um, we were calling the dot describe method on a data table or data frame and getting these count mins, averages, and maxes. So this is the type of SQL query that gives you these, um, these kinds of results, similar results. Okay. Um, so you can actually also combine aggregated results and non aggregated results, but the values are often surprising. So here um, I'm adding, let me just get rid of all this stuff. Um, and just get rid of that too. So here we're aggregating the uh, reading column 
using the count function. And then we've asked for the person column. So what do we get? Well, when we do the aggregation, that's collapsing a whole bunch of values down into a single value, whereas the person column has a bunch of values. So how did we get this dire? Why was this person chosen in this particular situation? And the answer is it depends on the implementation details of the database. So like this is kind of a nonsensical query. Like this is not. Um, so when you combine, even though it's a valid query and it delivers some results, it's not really the result that um, that you probably are looking for. Um, the other is that if there are no values to aggregate, then you get back um, um, null results. So for example, um, if we were to do uh, select person a max reading uh, from survey table where quant equals, and now we're just going to put some string in here that we know doesn't exist. So when we run this, we get back something. It's a, we don't get an error or anything like that, but we get back null values. Um, and I just want to point out that um, aggregation functions ignore null values. Um, so it's um, it's an important way in which aggregation functions differ from other other functions in SQL. So we want to ignore null values when we're aggregating. Um, we don't want to allow them to corrupt or pollute our calculations when we're doing aggregation functions. Um, so, and remember, so I noticed, I noticed there's some comments about um, uh, invalid syntax. So um, if you, for those of you who might have joined late, so there are two different kinds of notebooks here that I'm using. So one is a Python 3 notebook, and that was called sandbox.ipynb. And there, when in a Python notebook, if you want to write SQL, you either have to use this um, percent, percent SQL cell magic together with your SQL in order to have it be valid. Or if you're going to put it all on one line, then you can use the, the percent SQL um, just the single percent. Um, so this basically works because everything is on one line. If you want multiple lines, then you need to use 2%. If you open the Zeus sandbox.ipynb, then you'll get the Zeus SQL kernel and you can just write SQL commands um, without having to use the IPython SQL magic commands. Okay. Um, okay. Where were we? Um, okay. So often aggregating like all the records at once doesn't make any um, any sense. Um, so you know, usually we want to almost like group rows together and then aggregate across records within a particular group. So for example, one way that you could do this would be to say, well, um, what if I want to um, compute descriptive statistics uh, da, 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 for, da, da, how should I, how many, all right, so if we wanted to do some descriptive statistics again, so we'll do count um, and uh, round average reading to two decimal places from the survey table. OK. 
Okay, so here we're uh, we are aggregating across the entire table where it doesn't make sense to do this because we're aggregating um, quanti different quantities, salinity, radiation, things like that. So we actually only want to aggregate um, where quant is equal to a particular quantity. And even then, maybe we don't want to aggregate across a particular quantity. Um, maybe what we want <clears throat> is to aggregate across a particular quantity and where the person is um, a particular person. So now we're basically computing descriptive statistics for the radiation measurements taken by the scientist Dyer. And then maybe we put that name there. Okay. So here we've, we've created these groups effectively where we're, we've grouped the rows by those rows where quant is radiant and person is dire. And then we're computing the descriptive statistics for that. Um, and notice now that it's okay to just put person here, like a raw column together with some aggregations because we have already restricted person to be equal to dire for all of the readings that are going to be in our results. So then choosing one is going to be choosing from dire and therefore it will always be dire. So, so that works out just fine. But what if we wanted to do the same query, but for uh, salinity? Okay, and temperature. And for you know a different scientist. So writing the same query over and over and over again is um, is tedious. And so one of the ways that we can improve upon that is by using a group by clause. So if we wanted to compute descriptive statistics for all the different quantities and group by, or sorry, for the uh, descriptive statistic for radiation, but we wanted to group the records by the person who took the record, the scientist who took the, the radiation reading rather, and then generate the descriptive statistics grouped by those persons, then we could run this query. And then we would get these results. And we can even get rid of this where clause entirely and make an even more general query where we do uh, this. And now we'll add a quant here. And now we get these results. So there are some, we had some missing scientists. So null is going to show up in our results. And then we have grouped, we have unique person quantity pairs, and now we're computing the descriptive statistics over the reading or the records that fell within these grouped person quantity pairs. So these are now getting to be some kind of like proper, uh, you know, non-trivial data analysis type queries that you would would run on a on a real database. Um, if we wanted to make sure that our results showed up in a, um, well, first, if we wanted to, let's say we wanted to drop the null values. So if we wanted to drop the null values, we could go in here and say, we want to do these selections where person is not null and then group by, so this gets rid of the null values. So you can see the null values are gone. And then um, if we want to get a consistent ordering, we can add an, an order by clause. Order by um, person ascending, quant descending, just And so that would give you uh, these results. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so let's walk through this query. So this query would be would be executed by the um, the database manager in four steps. So first, um, the first thing would be the entire table would be filtered using the where clause. So that would filter out records where person is null and leave only the records where person is not null. Then the group by clause would be executed to group those remaining records by distinct person quantity pairs. Then the uh, order by clause would be executed, which would reorder the rows, um, reorder the, uh, the grouped records according to person quantity, according to the ordering here. So ascending by person, descending by quantity. Then the aggregation functions would be run. So count round the average, and then the select person quant would be, um, and then the select statement would be done. So the select statement is actually the last thing um, that would be executed. Okay. Um, so there are some, a few exercises here. So let's take a look at, um, I'll give you maybe five minutes to work on work through these exercises and uh, and ask questions if you have any. Set my timer. Um, but please have a look through those exercises. You know, now we're getting into some more um, sophisticated queries, uh, SQL queries, and these are the kinds of queries that I run. Um, on a more frequent basis. So lots of select where group by order by type queries. You may have noticed that um, for those of you who attended the introduction to Python, um, that um, that there's a lot of similarity between the way that pandas sets up things with group buys and sorting and filtering. And that's not an accident. So SQL has been around for quite a long time. It's been very, very influential um, in the design of many data analysis libraries like pandas. And a lot of the functions that you use in these data analysis libraries are ones that are basically bringing functionality that SQL already has into these libraries. Um, so by learning how to use SQL, it means that you can write these SQL queries to do a lot of this computation on the database before you actually get the results down into your Python environment. And that will often be much faster. So the databases are typically highly optimized uh, for performance software. And, um, and by pushing as much of this kind of data analysis computation into the database using SQL, you can get a smaller set of results that then you can crunch on in, um, in Python. And that will often be much more performant than just doing some simple query like select star from a table and getting this huge bunch of results down and then filtering and things in, in Python. Um, so let's see. So it seems you can't filter with where reading greater than average reading. Um, hmm. I think that actually might be true uh, because of the, so the question, there was a, a question much earlier about, could we define an outlier as being a value that was greater than average? And, uh, and you might not be able to do that because of the order in which the queries are gonna be executed. I'll play around with this while you guys are working on your exercises and see if I can come up with something.
Okay, uh, I think I found a solution. Uh, just give me a moment to uh, to check this. Okay, got it. So let me share my screen. Okay, so earlier there was a question of um, of basically uh, how could we do like uh, filtering as a function of the values in um, a column. So in particular, we wanted to select uh, values where the quantity was greater than the average value of that quantity. Okay. So here is an example of a query. Um, so I'll add a comment here. Um, uh, so it computes the average uh, radiation value. Oops. Um, uh, you know what? I've forgotten off the top of my head what the quote. Um, I'll just do this. Okay. So here we're going to compute the average radiation value. So here we're using this aggregation function to average the readings from the survey table where the quant is rad. Okay. Now we could select all the records from the survey table where the quant is radiation and that quantity is greater than this 6.5, 625, right? So that, that's doing two different queries that give you the results that you want. And now you might say, well, how can I do this in one query? And the answer is to use something called subqueries, which is a, actually a more advanced topic than what I had uh, plan to cover, um, but I'll just kind of mention it in passing as something that you can do. And you can actually um, embed a query inside of um, a query. So maybe we can even write it like this to make it more readable. Yeah, there we go. So here we have a subquery. So we've replaced this quant greater than or equal to with a subquery. So instead of hard coding this value 6.5625, we actually take this query that we wrote and just embed it as a subquery and put parentheses around. And so what will happen is that the database manager will see the parentheses, will go into the parentheses and see, ah, okay, there's a query in here. So I will execute this query and get the result. And that result is a number. And then it will replace the value inside the, the query inside the parentheses with its result, which is a number. And then it will run this outer query. And so that's how you can get, and you can compare this table of results with this table of results and see that they're the same, I hope. I spot checked them before I shared my screen, but okay. 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 So any questions about um, what we covered in this episode or any of the exercises that you would like to go over? Um, and uh, if not, I'll just move on to uh, the, next, uh, the next episode. Some queries are 
um, an advanced topic, but they are super, super useful. And in fact, probably um, impossible to do many of the things that you might want to do um, in SQL without subqueries. Okay, so since no more questions, I will move on to the next episode. Combining data. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, we'll go up here. No kernel again. Um, that's not good. Hmm. Oh, no. I think I just lost the connection to, oh, man. I think I just lost the connection to the Jupiter lab, which means I've lost all the work that we've been doing. Ugh. That is really frustrating. Okay, give me a uh, give me a minute to see if I can sort this out. Um, did anybody else lose their uh, Uh, and there must be, it must have been some kind of big technical uh, issue then. Okay. Um, anybody using the Kaus Jupiter Hub still, still up and running? Because I was using the public Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Hub. Maybe there's been some huge Google outage or something. I'm surprised. I've and I've been teaching this using Binder for four and a half years, and, and I've never had this happen. So it's quite rare. Um, okay. Well, I think the only thing that I can do, I, there's not going to be any way for me to recover this because I, th I think, yeah, because the whole thing is gone. Uh, okay. Um, well, okay. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, I don't think there is anything that I can do except uh, start over, unfortunately. So I will go back and get another instance of uh, Jupyter Lab running. And yeah, there's not going to be any way for me to get in here and save and export this notebook. Frustrating. OK. Um, so what I can do is So what I can do is upload the notebooks that I, I don't have the Zeus sandbox from last term with all the commands that I typed from the last term. So unfortunately, that's just gone. Um, but what I can do is upload the sandbox notebook from last term, which has largely the same kind of stuff that I typed in the last term um, for you to have some record of the commands that we type. Um, um, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start over and we'll pick up with combining data um, 
and I will just use the uh, the regular uh, sandbox notebook. So with IPython commands or the IPython SQL magic commands, um, and we'll just pick up here with uh, combining data. Combining data, no, uh, combining data. Okay, um, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, average of a set of values is the sum of the values divided by the number of values. So, yeah, so the average function is going to ignore null. So if you are, um, if you're given the values one, null, and five, then it, the sum is going to ignore the null and get six, and then divide by the, the number of observations, which would be the count, which is also going to ignore the null. So you'd get six divided by two or three. So those aggregation functions ignore the null. So it, which is, which is generally what you want when you're doing aggregation functions. Okay, so good question. Um, right, I'm gonna get my head back in the game. Um, okay, so combining data, right. So um, in this, um, in this section, we're gonna talk about um, how to, you know, what happens if the data that we need is spread across multiple tables. And somehow we need to join these tables together um, in order to um, um, access, let me just try one more thing. Oh, all right, I thought that might, might have possibly been able to recover it. Nope, okay. Yeah, all right. So, uh, okay, um, right. So we're gonna learn how to, how to join tables together and how to then access and write queries that will um, answer questions where we need to combine data from multiple tables to answer the question. Okay, so um, let's say that uh, we want to um, upload we want to basically take our data, aggregate it together, and then upload it to a site that catalogs historical, meteorological, or climate data. And um, and um, in order to do that, we need to format the data in a particular way. So in particular, we need to format the data in terms of latitude, longitude, date, quantity, and reading. Um, now, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, in order to do this, we need to combine data from multiple tables because the latitude and the longitude are stored in the site table, you know, with the site's name and its geo coordinates, Latin long. The dates that the measurements were taken are stored at a completely different table, the visited table, and the readings themselves are stored in the survey table. And uh, so there's three different tables and we need to combine data from three different tables to get the answer to this question. And these little arrows are um, pointing to common fields across tables. So for example, the name column in the site table maps to the site column in the visited table. And the ID column in the visited table maps to the taken column in the survey table. And the ID column in the person table maps to the person column in the survey table. So there's these are the relations between the tables, and that's why the we've I'm called this um, relational database. So there's the tables of data, and then the relations between the tables that describe the overall data set. So we're going to use a command called join to join. Uh, two tables together. So in particular, if we do select um, so we're going to select all of the data from site and we're going to join visited. And so what has this done? 
So it has taken, um, it's created something called the cross product of both the tables. And so the way that you can figure out you know, how many columns and rows should be in the output um, of, this, uh, of this query, well, the site, uh, the site table has three columns, name, lat, and long. The visited table also has three columns, ID, site, and dated. So the number of columns is going to be the sum of the number of columns in site plus the number of columns in the visited. So we're kind of joining those columns. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Now with the rows, it's a little trickier because we're doing the cross product. So that means when we just join like this, we're joining um, each record in the site table gets joined with each record in the visited table. And then we go back and get you know, another record from the site table and join it with all the records in the visited table and so on and so forth. And so that means that we will get the number of records in the site table uh, times the number of records in the visited table will be the total number of records in the result. So this is called a full outer join or a cross product. Now, you might be thinking like, well, this is just nonsense because these rows, some of these rows have nothing to do with one another. Like you can look here and see, well, okay, well like this row seems okay because both the site and the name match up, but this row doesn't make any sense. The, the data from the site column is DR1 and then these lat long coordinates, but then it's joined up with data from the visited table that has nothing to do with DR1. It's data related to DR3. So like, how do we, how do we do this join properly? Like this is clearly not what, not what we wanted to do. So to do that, we join, not just doing a full outer join. Typically we're going to join, um, join tables based on relationships between fields in those tables. In particular, we're gonna join on the site.name is equal to visited.site. And if you look here, this goes back. So you can see here that the name column and the site column, we want these to match up. And the name column comes from the site table, and the visited or the site column comes from the visited table. And, um, and you can see these are the relations here. So we're using these relations between the tables to help do our joins properly. And so now when we run uh, this query, we'll get the results that we, this is like the kind of what you would probably expect when you want to join those tables. Like you want to get join rows where the data match up in some sensible way. Um, so there's a couple of questions in, in chat. So which is more powerful, faster subqueries or joins? Um, they serve two different uh, two different purposes. So um, so sometimes one might be faster or the other. It would depend on the context, but they serve two different functions. So don't, it's best to think of them as two different uh, techniques. And then the second question is: Are we doing? Are inner joins similar to Oracle SQL um, and outer joins? So I've never used an Oracle uh, SQL database. So um, I don't, can't really speak definitively about uh, how Oracle implements their uh, joins, but the way I would hope that they follow the same, the same implement that, well, that when you do a join, because um, here we're just writing this SQL has nothing to do with like the database implementation and um, whether it's Oracle or SQLite or Postgres or MySQL or something like that. So I would hope that the way that um, that Oracle um, handles joins is similar or is identical to what we're doing here. Let's put it that way. Um, right. Uh, okay, so we join these together, uh, and you can some sense like 
uh, or is very, or this on is very similar to a where clause, um, but it's the special keyword that we use um, in here for joins. Ah, so there's another question of like, we have duplicate columns in here. So how can we, uh, how can we get around that? Well, um, one of the things we can do is to be explicit about the, uh, the information that we want. So in particular, we could do um, select uh, site.lat, site.long, uh, um, visited dot, uh, uh, dated, probably do this. Um, from site, and then I would probably put the join on a second line. And so then we could basically, just, and then we could just get this information that we, that we have here. Okay. And notice here that we've, the, the null values are being included. If we wanted to explicitly exclude them, we would have to add something like, um, um, aware clause to exclude them using is uh, not null or something like this. Um, so da, 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 what else? So we could do even more complicated joins. So let's suppose that we wanted to join. So we've joined um, site and visited, but now we need to get the actual readings from the, uh, the survey table. So we're going to join visited on site.name equals visited.site. And now we're going to join, um, uh, or no, we're not going to do another join. We're going to do um, an and clause because we want to join uh, visited, sorry, that's right, join survey. So now we're going to join um, and let me, sorry, I'm trying to think about how best to organize this. And I'll keep with election notes. So we can keep the select statement all in one line. And then we can think of this from with all these joins in here as kind of the overall table that we want to re. Um, uh, we want to pull from, and then maybe put the on uh, site.name equals visited.site. And now we need to use the other relation, which is that the visited um, dot ID is equal to the survey dot taken. And note that we, we don't have to include these columns in the results. Um, I'll walk through this, the schema or the schematic of how this query is executed. But again, we can still use these columns when doing the joins, even if we're not including them in the results. And let's say we wanted to uh, exclude uh, the null values. Right. And oh, we forgot the uh, the data from the survey table. So survey dot quant and survey dot reading. Okay. And so now we've basically we've joined these three tables together and got the resulting format that we wanted, which was lat geolocations of where the reading was taken, a timestamp or date, the quantity that was measured, and then the overall value. Um, oh, but we have some, uh, we have these bad values for salinity in here. So we know that salinity is supposed to be between zero uh, and one. So um, let's see if we can't um, add some more statements in here. So if we said, and, um, Ooh, bah, 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 bah. Nah, I don't want to go down this road. It's just going to get even more compl more complicated. Let's just keep it at the at this. 
Um, right. Okay. Um, so now I want to mention the concept of, of primary key and foreign key. So, and because we did these joins on these particular columns. And um, so a primary key is either, it could be um, a column or multiple columns whose values uniquely determine the values in the other uh, columns in the table. So for example, if we go back up here to our relations, so this in the site table, so select star from site. So the name is the key, it is the primary key. So the name column, the values in the name column uniquely determine the values in the other rows. Yeah. Um, so the name would be the primary key. If we looked at the visited table, the primary key in the visited table is the ID column. So these are the unique identifiers that identify the other records or the other rows. Sorry, no, the other column, the values in the other columns. Um, but site is what's called a foreign key. So a foreign key is a, a column or columns in a table that are the primary key in another table. So the values here in the site column are in are the primary key in the site table. And that's this relation here is mapping a primary key in the site table to a foreign key in the visited table. And that's, that's why you join on these columns. Okay. Um, and part of this goes into database design. So in general, every table in a database should have a primary key. Um, and there are some other subtleties associated with how to design. There's a lot of subtlety in terms of how to design good, uh, good databases. And um, um, you know, if you're really keen on, on, on databases and there is good money to be made in database administration and, and database design, um, and uh, because so much of the world's data is stored in these big relational databases, there's a lot of money and, and making sure that the databases are both performant and well-organized and secure and things like this. Um, so if you don't know what in your, if you have a data table and you're not sure what the primary key is, there's always a default primary key, which is something called row ID. Um, which is basically just a unique uh, integer. So, and every table has it. So if you were to select uh, row ID from site, then you get a special column called row ID, which is just an integer that increments and can be used as a primary key if necessary. Okay. Wow, it's almost five o'clock. Okay, that little, we got distracted by that uh, technical difficulty that we had. Right. Um, uh, let's take uh, just a few minutes and have a look at these exercises. And whilst I, I look at our schedule and see what we have left and try to think about how to spend the next 15 minutes um, as wisely as possible.
Okay. Um, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so first, are, are there any questions about, um, about the exercises in combining data? Or, or about what we covered in combining data? Okay. Okay, so then what I propose that we do is, um, so we covered, I would say the like, 95% of, of the content that I wanted to cover. The, the rest of the, um, there's an episode on data hygiene, which is about if you were, so I, I mean, sorry, let me back up. So I covered everything that I wanted to cover about how to extract data from a database, uh, from a SQLite database using SQL, writing SQL queries. Like this is the, really the big goal that I had today was to, to show you how to do this. Um, the two episodes that I'm not going to cover on, on uh, data hygiene and creating and modifying data are episodes that are relevant for you if you need to create your own database. So like if you wanted to create a SQLite database and then put some data in there, then you would need to um, take a look at episodes eight and nine. Um, and um, so if, that, if you feel like that applies to you, then, then please take a look at that. Um, if you are going to work with data on IBEX, so SQLite is a great database uh, for IBEX because it can just run as a file. You don't have to set up a database server that somehow you've got to get your job on IBEX to access that server whilst the job is running, and that, that's very complicated. With SQLite, you can just have a file. So you can just think of it as like, my database is actually a file, and then it sits on your scratch uh, or your project space, and then you can access it from your IBEX job, no problem. So, uh, but you might need to take your data, which might exist in some other format, like a CSV file or text file or something, and get it into a SQLite database. And you can learn how to do that on uh, episodes eight and nine of, the, uh, of this training. What I do want to show you um, is, um, and we've been doing programming with uh, SQL within Python kind of all day. So I don't need to cover the programming with databases in Python uh, episode. What I do want to show you, uh, and then we'll talk about um, places to go to learn more, and then we, you can you know, ask some questions if you have any, any more questions. So inside the um, uh, introduction to SQL notebooks directory, I have a, a fair number of notebooks books that I made to help demonstrate some as different aspects of um, databases in Python. Uh, in particular, there's um, data programming with databases in Python, which is basically everything that's in here is included in this notebook. It's really kind of more low level, um, used to be how you would interact with databases in Python from Python, I would say, five to 10 years ago. Um, Databases with pandas is more relevant, but even more relevant, what I want to cover now is programming with databases with magics. So in this notebook, it's very short. I'm just going to show you how to extract the uh, contents of a SQL command like we've been running today directly into a data frame. So we're going to have some import statements. And actually, this import statement isn't neither of these import statements are necessary now that I think about it. We're going to need to load our uh, SQL extension. And I've also have a link here to a blog post written by, I think it's written by the author of the IPython SQL um, uh, package, which is just really good. Um, and uh, that we've been using. So I'll, there's a link here that you can, if you want to read more about but so we're going to connect to the database, just like we did earlier. And so what we're going to do is all, all day today, we have been um, basically running, let me get rid of that, running commands and just getting results and looking at the results. But what, what you can actually do is bind the output of this query 
to a Python variable. And then you can call uh, the dot data frame method on this variable or this actually what this type is, is an intermediate type that was created in IPython SQL and get a data frame back. So if we run this query now, this data frame actually contains the results of our query. And if we had a more complicated query, so like here's the, the join query that we just previously did, we can use the IPython cell magic and I'll just get rid of this. So if we run this query, so this is what we've been doing all day, but actually there's a, a bit of syntax where you can um, bind the results of the query to a variable of your choice. I just called it SQL results, but you could call it whatever you wanted. And that variable will then be available within your notebook. So we can run this query and it says returning data to local variable SQL results. And now we can get a data frame back of our SQL result of our SQL results. So this is typically how I work in my machine learning pipelines where I'm interacting with a SQL database. This is what I do. I have a, I, I have, um, I load the extension, I connect to the database, I write my SQL query, get the results back in some local variable. And then I dump that thing to a data frame. And then I'm off and running using pandas or, or scikit-learn or whatever else I want to use for my machine learning or deep learning pipelines. OK. So I think that's all I want to cover uh, today. Now, um, if you are looking, there's a lot of SQL tutorials uh, um, deeper dives into different aspects of SQL um, available online. Um, and there's a nice book called um, uh, da, da, da. Sorry, let me just Google for it. Uh, um, da, da, da. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, let me share my screen again. I'll put this link in the chat and also it will be in the comments section of the uh, of YouTube, uh, the YouTube video when it, that video is posted. Uh, where's my chat? chat. So um, if you really wanna get into uh, to using SQL, very valuable job skill, it will not be uh, will not be time wasted for sure um, in terms of leveling up your data science machine learning skills. I would recommend that you look at uh, Postgres uh, QL um, as the flavor of SQL that you familiarize yourself with. Unless you happen to work somewhere, if they have Oracle database and you need to access that SQL database and it's an Oracle SQL database, then you should learn and specialize in the Oracle variant of of SQL because that will be the most germane to your job. But in general, PostgreSQL is, I think, the most widely used um, SQL implementation. It's completely open source. There's this great book um, that is now in its third edition um, and uh, will help you get um, up and running um, and learn more about the, the details of of uh, SQL databases and things like that. Um, right. But again, if you are, so if you're here at Calst and, or if you want to, if you have access to IBEX and you want to store your data in a SQL database, then actually SQLite would be probably the best database for you to consider with, to consider because it, the file, the database itself is just a flat file um, that you can put in your scratch or your uh, project storage and access directly from within your Slurm job scripts. Um, um, and you won't need to set up a separate database server somewhere and make it accessible over the internet and all this other stuff. So, um, 
So that, so that would be, it's in general, Postgres is what I would push you towards. In particular, if you are working here on IBAX, then you might want to stick with SQLite. Okay, uh, any questions? Last minute questions? Oh, how are SQL databases are better than NoSQL databases? Uh, that is a, a very good question probably to, uh, to end the day on. So um, how best to start in with this? Right, okay, so maybe like five to 10 years ago, when all of this web data started exploding with Facebook and Google and Amazon and all of this data. So a lot of this data was what's called unstructured data, or it didn't obviously fit well into a relational database paradigm, or at least at the time that was the thinking. And so we need new databases and we need distributed databases with um, advanced concepts like sharding and replication and and everything. And we need new query languages to query these new databases. And they can't be SQL databases. Therefore, we'll call them NoSQL databases. And there are definitely use cases for them. There, and there's some really interesting implementations of, um, there's one called Cassandra. Um, let me uh, just share my screen again. Um, so Cassandra. So yeah, so Apache Cassandra. So this was a, a Facebook uh, developed uh, tool that was open sourced and it's used in um, really, really large data situations where the data base itself has to be distributed um, and where the data itself is not necessarily as structured as the relational data that we've been using here. Um, but unless you are in a very, very, very large data, large volume, use case like you know petabytes or terabytes or, or more of of data um, then this is not and unless the and unless that data is very unstructured so it doesn't neatly map into these kind of like table and relational structure then no sql databases is probably not um not what you're looking for Oh, another kind of NoSQL database that is worth being aware of um, might actually be more interesting for some people than something like Cassandra. Um, let me share my screen again. So I'll just put this. Uh, so there's the link to Apache Cassandra. And then uh, I'll share my screen again. So it is graph databases. So Neo for J. Uh, so there is, there's a few different kinds of graph databases. I haven't looked into this area in a while, so I'm, my knowledge is maybe a little bit dated. But for data where the database, the data itself is, is like, um, like social network or network kind of data or data that is best described as a graph, not necessarily as tabular data, graph databases are, um, have become really popular. And this one I have some experience with because I, I did work at a company once where um, we had we were extracting network data from a Postgres SQL database and we had to write these really, really complicated queries to find neighbors of neighbors of neighbors in a graph. And with graph databases, those queries are, are, are very easy to, to implement because they're designed to store data with the specific idea that the data itself represents a graph of some kind. Um, there's another one called like uh, Apache Giraffe, maybe something like this. Yeah. Um, so this is another uh, graph database. Um, we have a, at least one research group that's doing a lot of work on graph databases and things like that. And um, they may have some suggestions. I'll try to reach out to them and see if there are any new cool uh, graph database uh, projects that I could make people aware of. And if they are, I will put them in the links on the YouTube section. So there's the link for Neo4j. There's a link for Apache 
a giraffe. And um, right, so I guess the ultimate answer to the question of are SQL databases better than NoSQL databases, the answer is kind of boringly, it depends on the use case. My, my feeling is that there was a lot of hype around NoSQL databases and a general belief that, oh, you know, if you're dealing with big data, you must be using a NoSQL database because SQL databases just can't scale. And I think that that's been proven to not be true. I think that what has happened in practice is that um, SQL databases have gotten better. I mean, there is, with the ever increasing amount of data, there's a very strong incentive to improve the performance and uh, characteristics of the SQL databases. And I, I, what I have seen is a lot of SQL databases that are really tuned for particular use cases, like time series data, for example. And that's like, so um, if you need to do your know, time series database, time series analysis, then, you know, instead of moving to a completely different paradigm of NoSQL, you could use a very time series um, bespoke optimized SQL database and do just as well. I think that there seems to be a lot of that, unless you're, you know, in a either a really big, really, really large volume uh, data, so petabytes, terabytes, um, this kind of situation, or, um, um, or you have graph data. So those would be the only two, two use cases that I would consider looking at NoSQL databases. But great question. Okay, so since I'm not seeing any more questions, so um, thank you very much for coming and spending another Tuesday afternoon with me. So we have two more courses. So this actually, this completes the, uh, the core curriculum for the Introduction to Data Science Workshop Series. So well done for all of you who have um, attended all of the courses. I recognize some, some of you here. Um, so, you know, Thank you for attending all of the core, the core Introduction to Data Science Workshop Series courses. We have two courses left. One is Introduction to uh, Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn. So we're going to go through some machine learning pipelines uh, with Scikit-Learn next Tuesday afternoon. And then the following week, um, on I believe the 6th of April, we have uh, Introduction to Image Classification with Keras and TensorFlow. So that'll be taught by my colleague, Glendon Hulse, and I will be there um, in support um, and to answer any questions that, that you might have. Um, but then that will wrap us up for the semester. So if you haven't registered, there might be a few places left. Uh, you, if, if there are, there will be a registration link sent out in the feedback email, which you'll receive tomorrow, which will have the link as well to the YouTube channel and the recording of today's workshop, which I will post um, probably tomorrow morning. Um, so again, thank you very much. And hopefully I'll see some of you next Tuesday. Bye for now. Thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs>